Hello, everybody, and welcome to this webinar. Um, so my name is Jana Croniale. I'm the educational manager of BTS company. Uh, thank you very much for your attendance because uh, there are a lot of people who are attending this meeting. And so it's a pleasure for us to, to have a so large number of uh, attendees. Um, during this presentation, I'm speaking about the BTS clinical functional protocols and how to perform a functional evaluation of the patient uh, thanks to the wearable uh, sensor. Okay, um, let's start. So the first meeting between the clinician and the patient is an essential moment because the clinician is asked to decide what kind of techniques have to be used for the treatment of the patient. The first meeting, uh, um, during this first meeting, the clinician uh, takes advantage of different tools to start uh, his clinical decision on the patient. The conversation with the patient is important to start and collect uh, all the information necessary to define the medical history. But uh, even more important is the objective physical exam of the motor behavior, which uh, includes a global functional assessment of the patient. Here we can see two possible different approaches to evaluate the movement. We can study the kinematics of the movement. That means the evaluation of the spatial and temporal parameters and the variation of the joint angles during the movement. And we can also evaluate the EMG data that are related to the muscle activity and hello understanding how the muscles are working during the execution of any motor task. Thanks to the functional protocols, we can assess the motor behavior of the patient through the kinematic and the EMG approach. About the kinematics, the technology that uh, can support the kinematic analysis of the patient is the BTSG sensor that allows a, a rapid and objective evaluation of the spatial and temporal parameters and joint angles. Based on uh, which is the specific motor task to be studied, the G sensor can be placed on any body segment, for example, on the head for the analysis of the cervical spine mobility, or on the trunk for all the trunk movements, on the humerus for the shoulder movement analysis, on the pelvis for walking, running, jumping, and so on. As I just said, the G sensor provides the acceleration and velocity values of the specific motor task performed. And at the same time, it allows the evaluation of the joint angles within the movement cycle. The technology that can support the analysis of muscle activity is BTS 3MG that allows a dynamic and not invasive functional evaluation of the activation of the muscle chains, providing information about the timing, the duration, and the amplitude of muscle activation during the movement. The EMG props can be placed on all the surface muscles based on what is the motor task analyzed. And through the recording of the uh, myoelectrical signal, uh, it's possible to define the onset and the offset of the muscle in order to verify the uh, correct movement coordination because uh, it's mandatory that uh, one muscle uh, is activating within the movement cycle exactly when it must be active. And then it's possible 
to evaluate also the amplitude of the activation in order to establish which is the contribution of each muscle for the execution of the movement. The integration of these two technologies has led to the creation of a real solution uh, dedicated to the clinical and sport fields for an accurate, fast, and effective evaluation of the patient based on the functional protocols. Here we find an example of functional protocols. On the first line here, there are the protocols mainly dedicated to the clinical work. On the second line, there are that ones dedicated also to the sport field. We have the working protocol, the flexion relaxation protocol for the analysis of the lumbar spine for the um, prevention of the low back pain, the cervical spine mobility protocol for the evaluation of the cervical spine section, the shoulder uh, mobility protocol for the analysis of the shoulder joint, the static posture protocol for the postural evaluation, and for the sport field, we find the running protocol, the cycling protocol, the drop fall protocol for the prevention of the anterior crusate ligament injury, and lastly, the dental occlusion protocol for the evaluation of the neuromuscular balance of temporal and mandibular joint muscles here to test the use of the bite, for example that it's um, most common in the sport field. All these uh, functional protocols um, included, of course, in the software package offered by the BTS analysis system, uh, allow to perform the evaluation of the patient starting from a single district, for example, up to a complete global assessment of all different body segments so that the clinician can formulate his own functional diagnosis. What is this functional diagnosis? Is uh, It's the identification of the main movement disorders, the residual potentialities, and any compensation strategy adopted by the patient. All these objective and quantitative data together allow the clinician to set the most effective personalized therapy for the patient and in the post-treatment highlight the benefit of the performed therapy. Now, uh, I would like to give a synthetic description of the contents of the clinical protocols so that you can understand what type of information you find in the report in terms of parameters, indexes, and graphs. Okay, let's start with the work protocol. Thanks to the work protocol, it's possible to verify if the muscle activity, mainly of the lower limb muscles, follows the physiological behavior, and therefore it's possible to understand if the patient has a good coordination and symmetry of the movement, or if due to neurological or orthopedic disorders, the walking is compromised and altered in some of its phases. Okay, in this video that we have realized for you, okay, we would like to show how to prepare the patient. So first of all, um, we have to apply the EMG props on the muscles that you need to, to test. Of course, this is a, a demonstration video. And so we are showing how to place the electrodes on tibialis anterior and the gastrocnemius medialis. But the, um, the muscle setup is completely free and so the clinician can set the muscles that he needs to, to test, okay? It's very important to place the electrodes uh, in uh, an accurate and precise way. 
uh, usually, so we, we can follow some uh, advices that we find uh, from the literature in the guidelines and uh, they suggest to, to place the electrode exactly on the muscle belly, okay, in respect with the muscle fiber direction. Okay, I move uh, fastly the, the video, okay, ahead, okay. And uh, after applying uh, the electrodes on the muscles, it's necessary to place also the sensor for the, the movement, okay, so the inertial sensor, that uh, in addition to all the uh, temporal parameters, acceleration, velocity, okay, allows to define the gate events and the kinematic of the pelvic. Okay, when the patient is uh, ready, okay, he can start to walk freely. You can see that uh, the, the, there is no any cable Okay, because the transmission of all the signal from the G sensor and from the EMG props is completely in absence of cables. Okay, the G sensor use a Bluetooth connection, the EMG props use a Wi-Fi connection. Okay, the protocol uh, returns the indexes of, uh, just a moment, I would like to zoom, okay, okay, here, you can see that in the final report, okay, uh, sorry, uh, after the acquisition, you need to perform an elaboration of your raw data, but the software performs this computation automatically. So the clinician, the user has not to, to do anything. So after the acquisition, the computation is automatic and the clinician can arrive immediately at this final report where um, you find some indexes of symmetry related to the capability of the patient to have a good symmetry <laughs> while walking, okay? We have also an information about uh, information about the quality of the gait cycle. So you know that uh, um, your gait cycle that represents your 100% uh, is divided uh, into main phases, uh, swing phase and stance phase. The stance phase represents the 60% of your gait cycle and the swing phase represents uh, the 40% of the gait cycle. So, uh, if the patient has the capability to divide and to maintain this good distribution between stance and swing phase, uh, the, the gate quality index is higher, uh, close to 100. So the ideal score of 100 is achieved when the stance phase and the swing phase represent exactly the 60 and the 40% of the whole gait cycle, okay. In this other page, we find the main temporal parameters of the gait cycle, so such as the duration of the stance phase, the swing phase, the single and double support phase, the cadence, and so on. And all these parameters are compared with some normal values. In the software, you have the possibility to select some normal reference in order to compare the, the data of your patient. In the next page, we have the pelvis movement on the three planes on the body, so sagittal, frontal, and transversal, during the execution of the right and left gait cycle. For this reason, you have two different colored lines, the green one and the left one, because they are referred to the movement that the pelvis has during the execution of the right cycle, and in the, the red line represent the movement of the pelvis during the left gait cycle execution. And you can immediately understand that the pelvis, uh, the pelvis is only one bone. And so uh, 
the, its, its movement uh, must be the same during the execution, both or right and left uh, uh, gate cycle. Okay, all this information are coming from uh, uh, the, the, the G sensor, of course, that uh, is placed on the pelvis, uh, if you remember. Finally, we have the muscle activity uh, with also the co-activation index of agonist and antagonist muscles, where you can assess the patient coordination. This gray band here, okay, allow to remind in which phase of the gait cycle that muscle must be active. And so it becomes immediate thanks to this type of representation. So this, this representation is another type of representation. Usually you are, um, uh, it's more common for you to visualize the signal uh, in a row uh, type, okay? Uh, after the computation automatically performed by the software, you can have this other type of representation that allows to highlight the peaks of activation. And so immediately the clinician can evaluate if these peaks of activation are exactly within the gray band that identifies when the muscle must be active. Where you find white space without any gray band, it means that in that phase of the gait cycle, the muscle must be off. So in this way, you can understand that uh, it's immediate to evaluate if the patient has a good or not good muscle coordination. Okay, I think that we can come back. Okay. Now here we have the flexion and relaxation protocol. Uh, this protocol is used to evaluate the predisposition of people to develop low back pain and prevent its onset thanks to preventive treatments. Okay, starting from the standing position, the patient is asked to perform an anterior flexion movement of the trunk, keep this position for a few seconds, and come back to the standing position through an extension movement. During the maintenance of the flexed position, the lumbar muscles have not to work because uh, from the biomechanical point of view, other muscles are working for the maintenance of this position. And so it's possible to verify immediately if the correct relaxation phenomenon of the lumbar muscles has occurred correctly. Okay, during the preparation of the patient, it's necessary to place the EMG probes on the lumbar muscle in this way. So uh, first of all, we have to identify the lumbar district, okay, from the last vertebra up to the, the passage from the, the, the spine to, to the pelvis, okay, on uh, distal, uh, distal level. Okay, maybe it's better to move uh, faster the, the video. Okay, then we go to place two probes on left muscles and two probes on right muscles, okay, on right side. As usual, uh, the, the electrodes must be placed in respect with the muscle fiber direction, okay. We have to respect the same distance from the spine line in order to have uh, the, the right and the left props at the same distance from the loom, from the, 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 the spine line. Okay. We have to take in consideration also during the preparation of the patient that while the patient uh, is performing the, the flexion, we have a large movement of the skin. So in this case, we suggest to not uh, put the electrodes uh, too, too much close, okay? But we have to, to keep a little uh, distance between the electrodes in order to, to, to follow the, the movement of the skin during the, the flexion. 
in this case, after, okay, when we finish to place the electrodes, in this case, our G sensor, our movement sensor must be placed higher in respect with uh, uh, the, the, the working protocol. So do you remember in the working protocol, we place the G sensor on the pelvis. In this case, we go to place the, the G sensor higher, more or less so we are uh, around uh, T4, T5 level, okay? In order to quantify the flexion movement, okay? The result of the test is shown automatically in the final clinical report in which it's possible to assess immediately if the relaxation phenomenon occurred or not. So um, let's look, for example, um, this, uh, this graph related to the myoelectric activity of the left spinal erector muscle at L1, L2 level. It's very important to take in consideration immediately this uh, horizontal dotted line because it represents the energy level of the muscle in standing position. The first peak represents the contraction of the muscle during the flexion movement and the second peak, higher than the first one, represents uh, the contraction of the muscle during the extension movement. From this graph, it's immediate to understand that the relaxation phenomenon has correctly occurred because during the maintenance phase, that is this central part of the graph, the energy level of the muscle is lower than the standing energy level. Now, I would like to show another example. Let's look at how the pattern of the curve changes when the relaxation phenomenon doesn't occur. We can see immediately that the curve remains higher than the standing energy level. Okay, now um, let's move uh, on to the static posture protocol. This protocol allows the evaluation of the muscle strategy used by the patient in order to keep a static posture over, uh, over the time. Uh, okay, uh, surely the most common condition in which to perform the examination of, of the, the, the posture is the orthostatic posture, of course. But the use of the protocol can be extended for the assessment of any other posture in isometric conditions. Hmm? Okay. Also in this case, the muscle setup is completely free. So the clinician can select the muscles that he wants, but it's important that when you select one muscle of the left side, you have to select the same muscle on the right side in order to check during the computation and when you go to read the final clinical report in order to compare, to evaluate the the symmetry of, uh, of the patient in terms of capability to use in a same way, okay, and in a balanced way, the same muscles on right and left uh, sides in order to maintain uh, that posture. In this case, because we are in static condition, in a static condition, it's not necessary to use the G sensor, so the movement sensor, because in this case, we don't have any movement because we are working in isometric condition, in static condition. Okay. Let's uh, give a look uh, to the to the report, okay, the protocol provides indexes that allows us to evaluate if the same muscle 
of right and left sides of the trunk and are okay. Pay attention. You can select both anterior or posterior muscles. It's not necessary that you take in consideration only muscles of the trunk in the posterior uh, part of the trunk, okay? If you need, you can select also some muscles uh, in the anterior part of the trunk, okay? But thanks to this um, report, okay, here uh, at the bottom of the, the, the page, okay, you find these uh, indexes, the muscle symmetry indexes uh, that um, can, can show immediately if the, 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 the muscle of the right and left sides are working in a symmetric way to maintain the posture. In this case, because the patient, so this is the, the, really the, the, the report related to the patient that we have just seen in the video. Okay, in this case, because the patient has a scoliotic attitude, if you saw in the video, there is an important asymmetry between right and left muscle. And if we move higher in the page, we can see which is the contribution of right and left uh, dorsal muscle and lower on the multifidus muscles. Okay. The shoulder mobility protocol is dedicated to assess the patient capability to perform a um, flowing and simple flexion, abduction and rotation movement of the arm in order to point out the presence of muscular disorders uh, related to the shoulder joints. Also in this case, we go to place the electrodes on the muscles uh, that you, you need to, to assess. Okay, maybe uh, it's uh, suggested to, to change uh, the, the, the muscle setup uh, based on uh, which is the movement that you go to assess because maybe during the flex extension, it's better to evaluate, for example, in this case, uh, the anterior deltoid. When we go to assess the abduction, maybe instead of the anterior deltoid, it's better to assess the medial deltoid. So uh, the, the, the software allows you to change the muscle setup based on which is the, the movement that the patient is performing. Okay, so in this case, after applying all the electrodes, okay, okay, we have to place the G sensor in this position, exactly on the distal point of the homerous bone. And now the child will, uh, will show how to perform the movement. So we go to assess, okay, flex extension in this way. Okay. Then I, in, in fact, uh, as I just uh, as I just said, okay, in this case, uh, I am changing the position, okay, of only one uh, probe from the anterior to the medial deltoid. In, the, in this case, we go to assess the ab abduction of the shoulder. Okay. And finally, uh, I would like to show also how to perform the rotation. We have two different possibilities. So uh, taking in, in this position, the upper limb, okay, or if you prefer, you can stay with the elbow uh, attached to the trunk and uh, we, you go to perform the rotation, uh, moving your hand on the transversal plane. Okay, in this case, let's zoom in the, the report. In this case, the protocol returns a report that allows the evaluation of the shoulder kinematics in terms of a range of motion. 
here we find also some uh, indexes that measure the smoothness, uh, okay, in the second page, the smoothness of the movement. We also calculate the average jerk. The jerk is an, in, an index that indicates the smoothness of the movement. It decreases with the increase of the smoothness, okay? And here we can evaluate also the muscle coordination in terms of activation timing of each muscle within the movement cycle. Okay, so in this case, uh, on the horizontal axis, we have always the movement cycle. And so it's immediate to evaluate uh, how the muscles are working all together in order to perform the movement. So in this, in this way, the clinician can understand which is the strategy, the coordination strategy of, uh, of the patient. Mm -hmm. Okay, and uh, we have also here on your right side, also the percentage of each muscle contribution during the movement performance. So you have also an idea about which is the energy contribution that that muscle is uh, providing in order to perform the movement. Of course, you have for right side and also for the left side. Okay, similarly, uh, to what we have just seen related to the shoulder mobility protocol, the cervical spine mobility protocol evaluates the patient ability uh, to perform a flex extension, a lateral bending, and a rotation movement, both on the right and left side. Any possible muscle contracture, for example, or any disorder at the cervical spine level can move into an objective limitation of the spine movement. Okay, as usual, first of all, we go to place the electrodes on the main muscles involved in the movement of the, the cervical uh, spine tract. Okay, in this case, we are evaluating the cervical uh, spine muscle. And we go to evaluate also on the frontal plane the sternocleidus mastoideo muscle. Okay, that uh, has an important uh, contribution in lateral bending and rotation of the head. Okay, about the kinematic evaluation, okay, the G sensor must be placed exactly here on the occipital uh, protuberance posteriorly on the head. Okay. When the patient is ready, okay, he can perform a flex extension movement, a lateral bending movement. So this is the lateral bending, of course. Flex extension. And the rotation. Okay. In the report, the protocol provides um, the kinematic data. Okay, just a moment, I try to zoom. Okay, it's better. Okay, the protocol provides the kinematic data and in particular, um, it points out uh, not only the range of motion on the specific plane because uh, uh, pay attention, here we are in the lateral bending movement. So of course, uh, you have uh, the, the main component of the movement uh, in gray color. But instead of visualizing only the component on that plane, it's very important to visualize at the same time also the uh, movement on the other planes. 
in order to uh, evaluate uh, if uh, the patient can have uh, a compensation strategy on the other two planes, uh, okay, on which uh, there should not be any movement contribution or better, okay, we can have a little contribution on the other plane, but uh, it must be uh, limited, okay, because the main component is on that plane on which I'm performing the movement, okay. About the uh, muscle, uh, above, okay, of course, uh, we have the kinematic information for all the other movement, flex extension, and rotation, okay? We've always uh, the comparison of all the three components uh, during that movement, okay? About the muscle work, we find the energy contribution that each muscle uh, gives out in the different phases, sub-phases of the movement. The symmetry indexes are also calculated here which highlight the patient ability to use right and left muscles in the same way while performing the movement. Okay, finally, I would like to show something about the sport functional protocols. So I would like to show uh, very quickly. So an example of a running protocol. Let me zoom, it's very important. First of all, to define the cycle. In this case, we have the running cycle from the right foot contact up to the next right foot contact. In this cycle, we go to assess the muscle coordination in terms of timing of activation. And so they, these gray bands are very important and are very useful because they represent the normal timing of activation okay, of uh, a, a, a runner in a healthy health condition, okay. And on the vertical axis, we have the amplitude normalized to uh, the, the, the peak of activity in order to compare one muscle with the other one. In the first page, we have also the contribution, the energy contribution of each muscle in order to have an idea globally, which is the contribution of the right side and the left side. Exactly like the running protocol, we have the bike protocol. So, sorry, I forgot to, to say that in the running protocol, the G sensor has to be placed exactly like in the walking protocol on the pelvis, okay? In this case, in the bike protocol, we, in order to define the cycling cycle, we go to place the G sensor, not on the patient, on the subject, but on the bike, on the pedal of the bike in order to define the, uh, the, cy the cycling cycle, okay? And exactly with the same layout of the running protocol, also here in the bike protocol, we have the contribution of all the muscles in order to evaluate the symmetry of the patient, of the subject, in walking protocol, running protocol, cycling protocol, these are all movements that could, should involve in the same way right and left side. So it's important to assess if there is more or less the 50% of contribution of both sides. And exactly like in the running protocol here, on the horizontal axis, we have the right pedal cycle or the left pedal cycle. Within, we go to assess the timing of activation and the amplitude of each muscle. The drop fall, it's a very useful and it's a used a lot in the sport field because uh, thanks to this protocol it's possible to prevent the LCA injury because this protocol allows uh, to assess uh, to quantify the pre-activation timing uh, time of uh, the, the muscle of 
rectus femoris, vastus medialis uh, in the anterior part of the, the thigh, and uh, posteriorly of the biceps femoris and the semitendinosus. You know that the, the patient, uh, like uh, in the picture, like the picture can, can show, can start from a, a sort of a platform, and then the patient has to fall down, okay? He has not to jump. He has to fall down and uh, has to land on the ground on only one leg. And we go to quantify uh, the pre-activation time of these muscles before the foot strikes uh, the ground. Because you know that it's very important to have a pre-activation of the muscles in order to um, make stable the knee joint in order to accept the, uh, the strike with the ground. Lastly, we have also the dental occlusion protocol because as I said in my first uh, slides, okay, uh, also in, and mainly uh, in, in the sport field, uh, you, you know that many athletes uh, uh, are usual to, to have to use a bite uh, while during the performance. And so it's very important to assess that the bite uh, has a good balance. Okay, and so this, uh, this protocol uh, can assess uh, the, the neuromuscular balance between these uh, four muscles, uh, temporalis anterior and the masseter muscles uh, during the occlusion in order to evaluate if uh, your body center is good or not good thanks to a good uh, muscular balance of these uh, uh, muscle activities. Okay. Now, at the end of my presentation, let me stress again the importance and the great advantages that can be obtained by using the functional protocols. The benefits are for the clinician as well as the patient. It's clear the advantage of having quantitative and objective information that helps the clinician to better understand the patient's motor behavior. At the same time, the use of this technological solution allows the clinician to make explicit the need of treatment. And all that leads the patient to become loyal to the clinician. Of course, even the patient can take advantages. The technology allows the patient to move in total freedom and with the maximum comfort. The tests are very fast and the contents of the reports are very, easy, um, are very easy to read, even for the patient who can therefore find the satisfaction and motivation to perform the test. Okay, I have finished. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, I, I took uh, more or less uh, 45 minutes, okay, for this presentation, but I hope uh, to be clear. I would like to, to show all, uh, all that you can do with uh, this uh, solution, uh, thanks to the integration of EMG and uh, G sensor technology. And now I can answer to your question with the help of my colleague, uh, Daniele. Here we are. So wonderful, wonderful pre presentation as usual, full <laughs> of you, uh, <laughs> full of uh, hints and full of uh, highlights and points to be highlighted. So starting from now, we can accept questions. The first one uh, is already arrived uh, from Dr. Mike, uh, and the question is. Would it be possible to elaborate more on how dental occlusion can affect sport performance? Um, yes, so, um, okay, I, I didn't go in details in the report, but uh, uh, this, uh, this protocol provides many indexes 
in uh, Pope index, uh, uh, bar index, in order to assess exactly which is uh, the compartment of the, uh, the head that maybe is not working uh, properly in order to guarantee the, the muscle balance at this level, because uh, this doctor, the doctor, uh, I think, uh, knows very well that uh, many postural disorders uh, can have the origin exactly at this level. So it's important uh, to assess uh, the, the neural muscle balance at this level uh, during the occlusion with the evaluation of temporalis anterior and masseter muscles. Thanks to these uh, indexes, it is also possible to assess the energy in order to verify if um, there is a hyper contraction of maybe masseter that can move posteriorly the, 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 the position of the, the, the baricenter, the occlusion baricenter, okay? So I didn't go in details in the report, but there are many indexes that can uh, allow to have a, 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 a clear uh, um, visualization of the condition of the patient. Perfect, and if Dr. Mike, uh, I'm not saying the surname to privacy reasons, but doctor, if Dr. Mike uh, wants to add something, we are here. Uh, second question is from Dr. I think, uh, Lisette. And the question is, uh, when es de Puerto Rico y la saludamos en español. But the question is, <laughs> hello, in my clinic, we have the gate lab and also the G sensor for the G walk evaluation. These protocols, uh, are available for us. My clinic is SER de Puerto Rico. Of course, yes, because uh, uh, from the technological point of view, okay, if you have the gate lab uh, with the free MG also included and the G sensor, okay, from the technological point of view, you have all the instruments uh, to, to use the functional protocols. Uh, maybe you can uh, ask uh, to the commercial reference uh, of your Zoom in order to understand how to, to, to provide to you this protocol. For us, uh, it's uh, a simple uh, uh, installation that we can manage also from uh, the remote uh, desk, okay? Uh, because uh, from the technological point of view, you uh, have uh, everything. <laughs> okay, yes, of course. So we are ready to go and all set. And, uh, and Dr. Lizette says, gracias, o sea, thank you. Uh, mm -hmm. The other question is from uh, Dr. Priyanka. Um, is there a specific distance to be maintained between the inertial sensor and the EMG to avoid crosstalk, if any? Okay, so there are no there is no any cross talk problem between uh, g sensor and the emg probes so, so uh, the two sensor emg probe and the g sensor can be uh, positioned at the very close one to the other and you don't have uh, any interference between the two technology so what uh, you have to take in consideration, and it's very important, is the correct position for the inertial sensor in order to have a, a good and correct kinematic assessment of the movement. So you have to establish which, which is the good and best position for the G sensor in order to have the reconstruction from the kinematic point of view of your movement. And you don't have, you, you, you have to avoid cross talk between EMG probes. So when you go to place the EMG probe on one muscle, you have to be very precise in the position of the electrodes in order to avoid the cross talk. So the interference from other muscles. Okay. So the real problem is if you don't place correctly the electrodes, you have a cross-talk problem because you go to 
uh, insert uh, in the signal of one muscle that uh, you are taking in consideration, maybe the interference of other muscle signal coming from uh, contiguous uh, muscle, okay? So this is the real cross-talk problem, not between G sensor and EMG. Perfect. Um, so we, let's. From now we, we are waiting other uh, other questions, if any, because right now uh, we answered the, the three main topics that mm, someone wrote here. So let's let's say we 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 give another like two, three to five minutes to see if there are any any questions anymore. Um, but Daniele, sorry if. Uh, uh, the question uh, will arrive <laughs> tomorrow, for example, sure. it's not a problem because uh, everybody, all of your attendees uh, can, uh, can uh, write us uh, to, to this, uh, to this uh, mail address. Uh, and so uh, every time you can contact us without any problem, okay, don't hesitate to contact us for any question that maybe you will have uh, on the next days and not uh, <laughs> right now. <laughs> exactly. Also because uh, I, I take this assist from you uh, to remember that starting from tomorrow, um, this video of this presentation will be online on YouTube so everyone can see it again. And so maybe some question can arrive from there to rewatch something, some, some part, and then so uh, Diana, if you want just to remember the email address, we see it written right here, but yes. if someone wants to hear Marketing it, it's... Marketing at btsbyengineering.com, yes. That's right. That's right. So, uh, if for any question, feel free to ask uh, here in the next minute or so, or uh, to the mail that is written below. And uh, if, uh, if we don't see any question anymore, I think that we can thank every participant and can can you share the video uh, dr lizette again can you share the recorded video to us yes of course uh, you will uh, you will receive uh, uh, receive an email with the uh, with the link so no problem about that okay dr teresa says thank you and we thank you too thank um, you too <laughs> I think we can uh, we can salute. Yes. <laughs> okay. Perfect. So thank you very much again for your uh, for your participation. Okay, and I say goodbye. <laughs>